our first panel this afternoon uh, is going to address a subject that we've already talked about quite a bit today because it is now a, a big priority. I would argue that to date, cyber attacks have been expensive annoyances causing a lot of damage from a monetary standpoint. But I think after what we just heard at lunchtime, we can just imagine what malicious code in the hands of a terrorist could do. And so I think when we begin thinking through some of these issues around cybersecurity, that issue we talked about about proactivity becomes also important because if we're not out in front of some of these threats, they could be serious and that idea of life-threatening might no longer be something that was unthinkable. So anyway, we're gonna start off today uh, on cyber and uh, one quick reminder, at the end of the cyber panel, we're gonna do a transition directly into the critical infrastructure protection panel. So the next break will be the technology uh, reception at the end of two panels here. So um, there's a very short, maybe five minute, just changeover of the panel coming up between the two. Uh, as always, uh, for the panels, I'm going to introduce the moderator, who in turn will run the panel and uh, introduce uh, his or her guest. And as always, for those of you who know me, I'm not really big on reading long bios and things like that. I prefer to get right to the content. Um, you can assume that everyone we invite it to speak is really smart, has lots of college degrees, it's got tons of awards they've gotten over the years, probably too many to even mention. So you can assume all that, and I'm just gonna mention a word or two about Paige, the moderator here. I've known Paige now for quite some time. She is currently the Vice President of Cyber and IT Research at Virginia Tech Applied Research Corporation. She specializes in cybersecurity. She's been involved in it for over 28 years. Prior to her present job, she worked at uh, DISA and was in charge of strategy there, IT strategy at uh, DISA. Paige is well known as an expert around town in this particular field. We're very fortunate to have her. She's one of those ones that goes into the Hall of Fame on the first vote as soon as uh, her name is uh, nominated. So with that, I'm gonna turn, turn this over to uh, Paige Atkins. Thanks, Paige. Well, hopefully I'll live up to that reputation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to first thank AFSIA for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to address such a critical, relevant, and timely issue, being cybersecurity as it relates to the Homeland Security mission. Uh, and I have to say, unfortunately, our DHS participant couldn't make it today, but I assure you the remaining panel members will provide very diverse perspectives and create a robust discussion around this topic. So first, I'd like to give some very brief introductions to the panel members and then make a few introductory remarks of my own and then turn it over to, uh, to the main speakers. And I'm gonna start closest to my left and introduce Richard Puckett, who is the Chief Security Architect for General Electric and the platform leader for GE's newly formed CyberWorks program, which is designed to help protect GE's portfolio of critical infrastructure products and services from cybersecurity related risks. And we're really happy to have Richard on this panel to help provide that industry perspective. And to Richard's left is Darren Ash, who is the Deputy Executive Director for Corporate Management in the Executive Director's Office within the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC. Uh, among many roles that he plays from a policy, leadership, and oversight perspective, he is the agency's CIO, as well as the uh, Chief Freedom of Information Act Officer and Senior Accountable Official for Data Quality. And we're really pleased to have Darren uh, join us today to provide somewhat of a unique perspective from such a critical sector uh, within the critical infrastructure um, program. And then at the end of the table is Jeff Vos, who is a computer scientist at the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Uh, Jeff has quite a varied background before joining NIST. He was an entrepreneur, started up 
an, a company focused on software assurance, and he has uh, many interests, current research interests, particularly around vetting mobile application software, how apps depend on clouds, software certification ethics, and the internet of things that many of us have heard about. So before I turn it over to the panelists, I'd like to say a few words to help set the stage for our discussion today. You know, personally, I believe in the area of cybersecurity and particularly related to critical infrastructure, we spend too much time uh, trying to solve yesterday's problems and we aren't keeping pace with where we're headed in the future and we aren't addressing the growing complexity, interdependencies, as well as unpredictability of cybersecurity in the future. Uh, we have increasing uh, interest in and continuing reports on cyber physical attacks, uh, Stuxnet being the, the uh, primary example or, or the common example folks use. We have additional attribution on persistent threats in terms of cyber reconnaissance, uh, malware, as well as data exfiltration. And for those cyber folks in the room, I would imagine all of you are aware of the recent Mandiant report in that category. And we continue to struggle with establishing effective policies and process around cybersecurity so we can more effectively take advantage of emerging technologies and capabilities. This is truly a hard problem, and it will take all of us coming together to effectively fight cyber crime and protect our national assets. Uh, we need to be able to incentivize cybersecurity investments to include research and development, particularly as it relates to critical infrastructure, security, and resilience. Public-private partnerships in this arena aren't just needed, they are essential to our success as a nation as we move forward. So for this panel, we've decided to focus on three key element areas and challenges. Uh, however, as we get into Q&A, don't let that restrict your, your questions as we will field any question that you have. Um, so the first area we're gonna focus on is mobility. We all know we need it, we want it, uh, but getting there securely is still a challenge. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the challenge not just from an enterprise standpoint, but extending mobile capabilities to mission critical functions. Talk a little bit about the progress, as well as almost more importantly, the remaining gaps to continue that dialogue. Now, as we extend our reach with mobile capabilities, we see increased connectivity and sophistication in our critical infrastructure. Uh, and we have a growing dependence on, on cyber and exposure to the cyber domain which has created a tremendous opportunity for cyber physical exploitation. So think of using the cyber domain to create physical effects. Now, our luncheon speaker was phenomenal, uh, but it was a very graphic description of our challenges. In the cyber arena, it's a little harder for us to understand and grasp because it's not as graphic. However, now we're seeing more effects in the physical world, which could be catastrophic and we need to address those. Uh, in my personal opinion, the cyber physical area uh, is underappreciated, not fully understood, and we haven't adequately addressed uh, that in the critical infrastructure space. So we'll explore that topic in a little more detail. And then last but not least, we couldn't have this panel without touching on uh, the recent presidential executive order, some of the policies and challenges uh, to include information sharing, uh, as well as the cybersecurity framework, which is mentioned in that executive order specifically. So that's the framework. Again, don't limit your questions to those three areas. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first panelist, who will be Jeff Bose. Uh, thank, thank you, Paige. Uh, slide number one, do I, do I start this? pushing the button and uh, there's nothing there. Hmm. What do you think, Paige? Want me just wing it? Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, as Paige mentioned, I'm a computer scientist at NIST and I 
consider myself kind of much more of a, a technology person. I'm certainly uh, certainly not uh, well versed in policy, things like that. But one of the things I thought I would do is I thought I would just put on my professor cap for these five minutes and try to explain how I think about and how many of my colleagues think about the cybersecurity problem and how it's kind of evolved from embedded systems and other types of computing platforms. So what you see before you right there is a very simple little uh, system. It's got some software. It lives in a hardware environment, some sort of a hardware platform. That lives in some sort of an operational platform. And that's really good when you talk about embedded systems. But the interesting thing is when you start to go cyber, you start to go into mobility, mobile devices, and things like that, suddenly you grow this new thing called threat space because now you've got all these feelers, all these external probes where it's either sending information out, information's coming in. Uh, that applies to cloud computing. It applies, like I said, to anything in mobility. So the fourth oval right there is the threat space. So when you start thinking about cyber, you have to think about the hardware, the, hard, the software, the hardware. You have to think about the environment, and the environment's a hard thing to grasp. But think of it as anything that the hardware and software, when they're fused together, communicate with. This is where they get their operational inputs from. This is where they send their operational outputs to. But in the cyber world, you've got that unpleasant little thing, that fourth oval right there, called the threat space. So what do you wind up with? Is you wind up, when you fuse those four together, you wind up with a system. I think we all understand that but it has these inherited properties then. It has inherited properties concerning reliability, security, availability, performance, safety, fault tolerance, and I could go down the entire list. So the point there being is that when you fuse those four together under certain probabilistic scenarios, you wind up with a system with those characteristics right there and the question is, what do you really have then in terms of assurance? And so what I'm talking about then at a very high level is I'm talking about an assurance case for either cyber physical systems, uh, mobile systems, embedded systems, anything connected to the internet, anything connected to wireless. And that little story right there in those four ovals actually is a way to look at it and to begin to bound the problem. So, what you wind up with then in terms of policy, because I realize I have to bring policy into this conversation, is that does policy drive the four ovals or does the degree to which, whether it's financial, uh, we don't have enough time to build it right, we just have enough time to get something done. So does policy drive the four ovals and the amount of reliability, security, safety, fault tolerance, whatever you want in there, does policy drive that or does the limits of technology drive policy? Or is it a combination of the two? I put or in there just to make it simple, but it could be and or. But like I said, with my professor cap on, it's a very interesting question to have to ask in this space. And that doesn't matter, like I said, whether it's cyber physical, mobile, embedded, whatever type of a computing system you have, that's something you have to consider. Uh, so what is the difficulty? And I just listed a few things right there. The problem is multivariate. And it's not just the four ovals, uh, but the third bullet right there, time. And we'll see that in the next slide, and, and my last slide. Time is a very interesting adversary of this. Because when you look at the model, you can fix the software, you can fix the hardware, you can fix the environment. You're not gonna fix the threat space, so that's not a variable you can bound. You cannot bound time. It's another variable you cannot bound. Uh, you can bound things like I want a certain amount of reliability, I want a certain amount of safety to some degree, but safety, I'm sorry, security, but security is going to be a function of the threat space, and the threat space is not boundable. So this problem that we're trying to solve when we say we're going to try to solve the cybersecurity problem is a very difficult problem for those reasons right there. So this last slide, the only thing that it basically shows is that as time changes, every single thing in those ovals continually change. And so I can go out and change a version of the software. How does that affect my policy? I can change my policy that says I need a different type of software, but I can't get that type of software. I can't get the patches for it or whatever I need. So every single thing in here is so interconnected, and as time changes and, and the threats change, and I see some of you are writing down notes. You can have these slides if it, if it makes it easier uh, so you don't have to write it all down. 
but the threats are changing, the environment's changing, the, uh, the physical system you have it on, the hardware you have it on, the software, the versions, everything is in complete flux, and time's in flux. So that's the difficulty, in my opinion, of the cybersecurity challenge. And any solution that we as a community, I'm, I'm talking about the computer science and software engineering community, try to go after, and the, and the security engineering uh, community as well, that we have to go after, we have to somehow figure out which of these variables can we deal with, which of these variables can't we deal with, and how much is it going to cost us, both in terms of dollars and in terms of time, to try to solve and bound those particular variables in the uh, problem equation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And we'll turn it over to Darren. This is on? Okay. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank AFSIA for including uh, NRC. I think this is an important dialogue discussion about how we're collectively, all the partners within this organization, within the community, are protecting the homeland. And uh, really what I want to talk about for NRC, and I, I always like to start some of my presentations just explaining what the NRC is in probably about 10 or 15 seconds or less. NRC is an independent regulatory agency. We're not part of the Department of Energy. Our core mission, apologize, is to regulate the civilian use of nuclear materials and nuclear power. So if you think of a nuclear power plant like at Calvert Cliffs or North Anna, those are the licensees that we regulate. Those, are, those plants are operated by private industry and obviously naturally part of the critical, critical infrastructure. So why is all this important? You think about the plants that have existed within this country. We've got 104 operating reactors within the country. Think about many of them were built 30 years, 40 years ago. They were grounded in an analog world. Over the last couple of years, we've received applications and have since uh, approved several applications to construct new nuclear power plants within this country. Two uh, units being built down in Georgia and South Carolina. What is important about those units is they're not grounded in an analog world. They're grounded in digital instrument and control. So outright, we know that cyber is, is of importance to how and what we do and how we regulate, but also our requirements that we establish for these, these uh, companies. When uh, Paige mentioned about the presidential directive as well as the executive order, it made me think about something that the NRC put in place through final rule, basically a regulation, a requirement, several years ago, which established by, by rule cyber requirements for our licensees. What was important about it is these are outright requirements that are part of their operating license. So what we expected and what we required of these licensees, these companies, was to establish their plans, to think through how their, their response approach, uh, their training, how they would address cyber. And what's important about this is what we were gonna do with this. A, we established a requirement for them to, to think through how are they gonna provide for adequate protection of their computer networks and communication, really the core of what, we, what they do. They had to put these plans in place, had to submit them to the NRC. We had the responsibility to review them and most importantly, now we're actually in the stage of, and all the plans were approved, now we're in a stage of actually inspecting. One of the core parts of our mission, part of our core responsibility around safety, is the inspection of these facilities. Not just the nuclear power plants, but other licensees as well. And so it's now our responsibility, really started this fiscal year, fundamentally this fiscal year, to inspect against those plans. How well are those plants and those licensees doing against what they said they would do? the protections they would put in place, the training that they would put in place. And one of the things, and I welcome the thought that Jeff was at the table, when we established these requirements, what was most important about it, these were grounded in the NIST requirements. And we had a nice report from GAO that came out roughly about a year and a half ago that looked at and really compared our requirements against the NIST standards. And we matched up nicely. But that was part of our intent, part of our lesson learned, which is we didn't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of good things that we've put in place, particularly as a federal government, that we've applied to ourselves. And frankly, much of it was applicable to the critical infrastructure, in this case, to the nuclear, our, our licensees. Last point or two, um, before I get into lessons learned. The lead organization within the NRC that is responsible for these cyber activities is also the same organization that's responsible for the uh, oversight of the physical protections of these licensees. So when you think of force-on-force -force exercises, requirements around design basis threat, 
those are the types of things that this organization is responsible for, um, as directed by the commission. And so when we think about it, we look at, really look at holistically at the broad protections of our licensees and ensuring that, they're hap that they've got the protections in place to protect public health and safety and our environment. Um, real quickly, lessons learned, obviously skill sets, obviously having the right things and not reinventing the wheel, but also being able to, and this is something that we're going to be doing this year and have started to do, uh, I think started last year, which is continue to look at what you're doing, capture those lessons learned and continue to improve. And that's one of the things that I very much enjoyed about the NRC is we're a learning organization. And I think as this industry, as these challenges continue to evolve, we have to continue to adapt. Okay, great, Darren. Thank you very much. Richard. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Puckett. I'm the Chief Security Architect for General Electric. And uh, like Darren, I appreciate the chance to speak to you today on this panel. Um, GE as a company is broad in its portfolio. Many of you probably know us from our home-based products. But we are, in fact, in almost every one of the critical infrastructure domains as defined by DHS, which is a daunting task when you think about the spaces like healthcare, aviation, transportation, and rail, what we do for energy distribution and power generation, oil and gas. And in all of those spaces, we are involved in direct conversations with either government or our customers in the topic of cybersecurity. And, and I'd like to get a show of hands, you and I, really quickly. I, when, when I say cybersecurity, what, what does that mean to you? Is, is that really about maybe loss of credit cards or PII? Is that about the infections that may come from malware? Or is that about protection of a nation? So when I say cybersecurity, how many people think it's about loss of your credit cards? I didn't think so, not this community. How about the infections of malware? Yeah. How about maybe nation state behavior? Right. So this is the challenge we face as a company. When we talk to private sector customers, many of them think in more practical terms about what cybersecurity is. Maybe it's the loss of credit card information or financial data, uh, infection of their systems from malware. When we talk to government, uh, we often hear in terms of more critical stories. Uh, we, we hear about the nation state actors, uh, the reference to Mandy and Page made. When we talk to the military, we're almost exclusively talking about cyber warfare or that fifth dimension of combat. And when we think about the requirements that generate from each one of these discussions, they're all different. They're all very different. And, and as a company, we have to try to figure out you know, which are the ones that we pick and choose as a path to help best protect what we make. So one of the interesting problems we have today with cyber is the overbroad term and what it means to people when we're talking to them. So we tend to back up very quickly and, and validate that. To something that Darren mentioned as well, that we, we think, uh, or it was Paige actually, I think who said yesterday's problem. We think that legacy critical infrastructure is the Achilles heel of all established nations. When, when I hold up my iPhone, which I, I love, it's already obsolete. It's an iPhone 4, sorry. So the 5 has already come along, yeah. Um, when we think about critical infrastructure that exists in our power distribution networks, some of those are 18 years old. And as we begin to connect them together in ways to make them more remotely accessible, to mobile enable them to be managed on an iPad, um, they create new kinds of challenges for us. Some of them are in the product itself. Some of them are in the ecosystem it resides in. And some of them are very, very contextual problems. Uh, like I have a great appreciation for Darren's challenges in highly regulated industry spaces. And, and those run up against some very real problems, that intangible element that Paige referenced about cyber. It's not something visceral that you can see or feel, but cyber to physical consequence is a very, very big reality today. And, and we're trying to address that. So for us as a company, and, and interested to hear what you say, we're interested in that concept of treating cyber as more of a safety, a quality, and a reliability story. That's to make sure that what we're building um, is safe, is reliable, and, and is of deemed of solid quality, especially in regulated spaces, because we wouldn't willingly place faulty equipment into someone's network, nor would we want the software or the cyber elements of that product to be as, as uh, vulnerable. 
Um, lastly, I think as we talked about um, mobility, I think we'll talk a little more about that. It's a gigantic market force for us. Uh, so across the domains we participate in, probably many of you have been to hospitals and you see nurses and doctors with iPads. And that's no longer just about privacy data, but it's about controlling MRIs or CT scanners. Um, if you go into energy uh, distribution or power generation locations, what do those folks want? They want to be able to walk around a power plant with an iPad and connect remotely to these systems because it's an incredibly powerful and attractive capacitive touch tool. It, it's very visceral you know, for them to be able to touch and feel just as they would in power to turn a knob. You can do the same thing on an iPad. So it's a short hop from a learning curve. And what we're concerned about is as we see those increasing patterns of connectedness is how can we help protect that as our customers ask for us to to mobile enable systems or to make them more remotely accessible. Okay, thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, great introductory comments and while the audience is getting ready to step to the mics to ask questions, I'm gonna start the process. And I, I wanna uh, take a step back first and talk a little bit, I'll, I'll say at the policy level. You know, we've got the executive order that has come out, um, a key component to the cybersecurity executive order is the cybersecurity framework uh, that NIST is tasked to develop uh, to include things like standards, methodologies, procedures, um, the key areas that NIST is, is well known for. And uh, Jeff, can you tell us a little bit more about the cybersecurity framework and how industry can help in that process? Uh, sure, Paige. Uh, uh, the first briefing I actually got from our from our division director, uh, I'm in the computer security division at NIST, uh, we got that about a week ago today. And uh, she explained that we're going to start to, you know, put working groups together inside of the, uh, inside of our division, CSD. Uh, we're in the process of putting out through the uh, Federal Register an RFI. Uh, to industry. I don't know if that's out yet, but I think it's going to be coming out very soon uh, for industry to answer a fixed set of questions. And I think uh, it's a fairly long list. Uh, industry members obviously don't have to answer every question, and some of the questions are sector specific. Uh, the goal of the RFI is to be concluded in about 45 days, take that information, and then start to build out the framework and figure out who we need to incorporate into the building out of the framework. So we're only about a week or two into this, and uh, that's the only answer I have in terms of how industry can get involved right now. Uh, possibly there's other things that are going on at NIST that I don't know about, uh, but that's as much as I know today. And again, as people are getting ready to ask all these wonderful questions to the panel, most of our critical infrastructure is obviously owned and operated by the private sector, uh, though the federal government has a key role to partner with that private sector uh, to ensure, again, security and resilience, um, both from a physical as well as a physical cyber uh, and cyber perspective. And I mentioned the, the requirement for unity, for us to come together collectively to address some of these tough issues and, and my questions to the panel members, or my question is, how do we do that? How do we uh, look at the, I'll call it the integration of the regulated versus non-regulated uh, sectors? How do we incentivize industry? Uh, how, what method could be effective in pulling this together for a unity of effort? And that, let me start with Richard. Yeah, that's, that's an incredibly tough question. Um, you know, again, if, if I'm sitting in um, in the healthcare space or I'm sitting in the energy space, uh, there are really good standards that exist today. So it's really about implementation and, and how well you measure. The other thing is responsibilities. Um, when when we think about, I, I think of three things. I think about what the products and services are in a, in a given domain. I think about the ecosystems that exist in that domain, and then I think about the context of what you're asking. So, you know, where is everybody's role end and begin? relation to private sector, what's the responsibility of government, and especially when it comes to best practices, guidelines, and standards. And then when it's implemented in context, how do you make sure that maybe in highly regulated spaces like nuclear it's done appropriately? So that's an incredibly complex task. I, I think there's a ton of expertise in both areas, 
that in, in some spaces have done a fantastic job of getting together to produce good work. I think uh, NRC is a great example of that. Um, in other areas, I think there's much to be learned uh, from the other domains. And there tends to be a little bit of uh, siloing or isolation from one domain to the next because they think somehow that they're unique. But in reality, I think, um, you, you may have said it during that, that um, there's some commonalities in cyber that should be uh, viewed from context to, to address them the right way. So I think it's identifying the right people, making sure they're in the right roles in the discussion, and then really looking at best practices from other domains to bring in the ones that may be possibly weak. I more or less build up on it. I just think you can't look and act in a stovepipe, which is what I like about what's coming out of the administration. I think this goes back a couple of years and some of the work that goes on in terms of delineating roles and responsibilities, let's say, between the NRC and FERC. And for example, you know, this is stuff that I've had to, to learn and, and better appreciate is where does NRC's responsibilities as a regulator start and stop? Actually, where does it stop? And where does FERC's responsibility start? And a lot of it, um, simplistically, gets back to the, uh, the turbines and where gener en energy is actually created. Um, and at what point, you know, when it hits the transmission lines, does that, it, it, where, where, who's responsible for what? And clearly delineating those responsibilities so that we can demark that and we can work together. And again, it gets back to this concept, you can't operate in that stovepipe. up. You've got to look and act holistically and work with your logical partners. Any comments, Jeff? Sure, I'll, I'll just add, add, uh, add this. Sure, that does not have anything, that, there is no regulations. It's pretty much the Wild West. It's a slightly different problem because there is nobody building certified software where the requirements have been certified, the specs have been certified, it's gone through an extremely rigorous uh, test uh, process. Uh, that's not $1,000 per line code, but that's running a lot of our critical infrastructure. That might be like $10 per line code when all said and done. So it's kind of how much do you want to pay for in the security space? Uh, in the regulata regula regulated spaces that deal with safety, they know what they have to pay for, for that type of code. But in the security space, uh, there aren't many people stepping up to the plate that are willing to pay that amount of money. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to ask the audience, does anyone have any questions? I don't see anybody at the mics. Hello? Yeah. Thank you for your presentation, and I noticed that you guys uh, mentioned the Mandiant Report. And um, just had a question. Um, in publishing the Mandiant Report, they feel that this report will lead to increased understanding and coordinated action in countering APT network breaches, and they hope that its resulting exposure and discussion will thwart, thwart ATP uh, activities. Can you give me your opinion about whether you think these two desired outcomes are going to happen? I'll take that. I, when, when we think about APT, um, you, you can describe that in many different ways. You know, it's, it's again, it's one of those terms that's broad in its reach. Uh, that can either, I think, can be in the Mandiant Report context, APT1, which is a nation state actor, or it can be maybe a sophisticated group of, of cyber criminals that um, they represent a, a, maybe a, an increased sophistication, uh, a knowledge of vulnerabilities, and their ability to defeat uh, standard controls. I mean, it's a good good example of maybe how you want to describe them, and certainly your own definitions may, may vary. Um, when we think about the context of cybersecurity, it, it's almost um, Darwinian in survival of the fittest, and, and it's not ever gonna stop. Like, it's a problem that doesn't get better with age. Uh, so it's always going to be evolving. There are always going to be threats and how you counter them. So attack, defend will always go on. But as it relates to the general statement, I do think there are improvements that can be made, and, and I would agree with Darren that the EEO does represent an attempt forward to create that kind of defensive capability. I, I just, I'm, I'm gonna put it back in really the, an agency perspective, and I, I boil it down to two things. Is there, again, from an advanced persistent threat, either they're gonna knock you out, or they want your information. Yeah, it's pure and simple. So, 
it, it forces us and it, it really begs us to, to look and think and act differently about what are we trying to protect and how we're going to protect that information and how we're going to protect us. I was just going to throw one thing onto what Richard said about this is kind of an evolving threat. We're always going to have it. Uh, there's something new in kind of in the computer science software engineering community now, which you may or may not have heard of, but there's a discipline called malware genealogy. Some people refer to it as malware DNA. It's a very interesting field because when you start looking at things like Stuxnet and a lot of these things where suddenly there's this attack, if there's a traceability back to a father, to a grandfather, to a great-grandfather, to a much earlier version. And so as malware, as it continually evolves over time, it's never, almost ever anymore, a completely new piece of malware. What it is, it's a tiny, tiny twist on an old theme. And so a lot of people are starting to look at, well, if you can understand the genealogy or if you actually can trace malware, whether it's for mobile code or for anything else, then can you predict what the next set of offspring are going to look like? And uh, not that we want to do that. I'm not claiming NIST is doing anything like growing malware in a lab, because we certainly aren't. But I can tell you right now, there are people that are. And I'll just add one brief comment. I think whenever you improve attribution, you know, that has a tendency to help mitigate uh, though the threat vectors can always change over time as well. But I think attribution is a key component to ongoing mitigation of the cyber threat. Any other questions from the audience? No? Oh, yep. Chris Fair, Capstone Corporation, thanks for your comments. I think one of the great maxims that we live by is that necessity is the mother of invention. And invention is typically realized in advancements in technology that are <clears throat> driven by necessities relative to such things, for instance, population growth or drive for efficiency or quality of life or counters to emerging threats, what have you. But typically, those inventions and advancements also bring with them unintended consequences. One of the comments, Mr. Ash, that you made I found interesting with regard to the nuclear energy uh, industry is dealing with this dichotomy, if you will, between some of the older infrastructure grounded in the analog and the newer infrastructure, which is grounded in the digital. And so some implication that the digital is more vulnerable to the cybersecurity threat than is the, the older grounded analog. <clears throat> so as we expand in this invention and technology uh, advancements, do you see a uh, solutions to some of the problems that we're dealing with reverting back to the analog to some degree? One of the great accomplishments during World War II in dealing with communication security was actually reverting back to the Native American language in one case. So as we advance technologically in terms of uh, IT and the cyber threat, do you see some of the advancements in cybersecurity coming in a devolution, if you will, back to the analog to some degree? I guess you're, since you started with me, I guess I should be the one to answer that, or at least start <laughs> to answer that. I don't, I, I don't know, and I, I can't even predict if we would work our way back when I listen to your question, your comments, I mean, the first thing that I wrote down was really, it's, it gets back to risk. And what risk, I mean, as an organization, we, we focus on risk. What risk are we willing to accept? Uh, and obviously, as we've learned about these new capabilities, digital instrument control, they're not new, but our regulations had to mature and adjust to those new types of things, to the digital instrument control world. and based on our understandings and our research and our studies and tests, then we have to make some risk-based decisions uh, as part of our regulatory act uh, activities and our regulatory framework. Um, I don't think that's any different than any other organization, any other sector that's out there. We have to know what those risks are, and as an organization, we have to decide what are we going to tolerate, what are, we gonna, what are we willing to accept. I guess the only thing I would add from the software world, I think Y2K was kind of an interesting wake-up call. 
uh, from the standpoint of, in terms of software, when is it just too old? When do you just take it out into the backwoods and shoot it and uh, start over? And uh, for instance, would we go back to, uh, would we try to build parts of the internet with ADA? Would we go back to Pascal, go back to COBOL? I mean, how far back would we go if we thought maybe really you know, safer types of languages uh, were, were more advantageous than the ones we use today, which you know, have some dangers associated with them. And we're carrying a lot of legacy C code, a lot of legacy Unix around. We've been carrying that on our back now for, uh, what, 20, 30 years? Some of that code. You know, when do you replace it? So it's an interesting problem. You know, you're, I think the question was more analog digital, but from a software standpoint, there's also a very similar issue of when do you just basically say, we can't support it anymore? A real simple example was uh, I'm a volunteer for IEEE. IEEE had a system, they'd had it for 30 years. There was only one person left in Piscataway, New Jersey that knew how to maintain it, and he was retired. And uh, for him to come in and continue to maintain the system, he charged a premium, about $400 an hour. At some point, IEEE realized that to maintain the system, they just needed a new system. And they expended $30, $40 million and uh, didn't need him anymore. But there are interesting of issues there. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean that in a bad way, but, um, but uh, that, that was the reality. So, you know, decommissioning and legacy code and all of that, that remains a big part of the cyber uh, security challenge that we face. There's a lot of old junk out there and nobody knows how it works, why it works. They don't know if it's dead code, but you don't touch it. No, I, I think the only thing I'd add is we, we definitely see the need where we run into systems that are legacy outside of obviously you know, attempts at air gap. And, and I think we all know how well that works. Not very, um, if you're familiar with Stuxnet. And, and some of the other more industrial focused malware that is present today being socially engineered into position. So even in, in some instances, we're looking at ways to either encapsulate, isolate, or virtualize legacy systems to bring them forward so that we can apply new defensive technologies to them as opposed to looking to maybe obfuscate or rely on, on luck as a strategy. I think, it, in general, we have to move from a risk avoidance to a risk management approach, as I think Darren was talking about a little earlier. And you, know, you used to be able to say a secure network is one that's not connected to anything else, but that's not really true anymore either. So it's an interesting challenge as we take advantage of the technology but do it you know, by managing the risk associated with it. So are there any other questions from the audience? I'm going to ask one shift to mobility discussion, and I'll start with Jeff. An important component of the digital government strategy is the adoption of mobility workforce solutions and, and potential movement to bring your own device, uh, which obviously is a security challenge. And NIST has a huge role in drafting you know, standards and guidelines associated with that. Uh, can, can you expand on those guidelines, what they look like, and, and where there may be continuing challenges and gaps that industry and others may be able to support? Sure. Uh, right now, uh, we have three different groups uh, uh, in my division, the Computer Security Division, that are working on uh, three different uh, special pub 800 series that documents. Uh, one of them is the guidelines for managing and securing mobile devices in the enterprise. Uh, I think that one's out on the street right now in draft form. I'm not sure if it's uh, been finally approved. Uh, 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 I, I think it's very close, or, or may, maybe it has, and I didn't, I didn't find out about that. What that document is, is it's, uh, uh, there was a guy at NIST named Wayne Jensen some number of years ago. He wrote a special publication on the security of cell phones. And so basically, it's kind of a refresh on the original SP on security uh, you know, you know, problems that can occur in cell phone technology now applied to smartphones. So that one's out there. Uh, the one that my team's working on, which hopefully we'll have a draft out in about, uh, about a month or two, is we built a huge uh, kind of an internal laboratory for vetting mobile apps for Android. We've done this for DARPA. Uh, these Android phones now are actually fielded in Afghanistan and they were in Iraq. I think we have about 3,000 out there. It's called the Panther Program. So we've built a huge lab for actually how we bring in commercial apps. Uh, we don't know anything about them. We put them through an entire vetting process. 
We look for all kinds of security problems, whether they're Android specific or not Android specific. And we put them through the, uh, through the process. We allow vendors, if we find a lot of security problems or reliability or performance or battery problems that these apps cause, uh, we, put them, we can allow a vendor to modify them. This document will tell you exactly how we do that. And I know there are a lot of federal agencies that are really wanting to get their hands on that one. And there's a third document that I know is under pro in process. Uh, I don't know exactly where it's at. I think it deals with PIV uh, and derived credentials as it relates to smartphones, but I'm not at all involved in that one. Uh, if anyone wants more information on where that one's at, I think that one also is in a pre-draft form and should be done sometime in the first half of uh, this calendar year. So Jeff, what is industry's role in the development of those guidelines and standards? Uh, well, for the one that I'm working on, uh, they've actually taught us how to find out more things about malware than we ever wanted because they send us all this code, all these apps with malware, and we have to build new testing tools to try to ferret it out and get it out. So their role is basically to send us our test bed. And, uh, you know, we learn silly little things like, for instance, uh, everybody knows the display on a smartphone sucks up most of your battery, right? Everybody knows that which color pixel sucks up the most power out of all the other colors in the pixel you can put on your display? Which one sucks up more juice? Red. Red red's the hog. Uh, so, you know, we find out little things like that because if we're gonna field these things for soldiers and these apps are on these phones, we can't send them out on a mission where some application, because it's got a really red screen, sucks the battery dry and the phone's only good for a couple of hours as opposed to a 16-hour mission. So. That's kind of how industries helped us, is they've taught us a lot of things about smartphones we never knew. And now we have test tools to test for these various types of properties. So that's only, in my case, a very simple example. Uh, right now, the way industry can help uh, is basically just wait for these drafts to come out for public release, and please send back comments. Uh, I did one of these about a year and a half ago on cloud computing. It was the 800-140 something or rather. I can't remember what the number was exactly. And we got over, oh, I want to say 500 comments. I mean, we had every major vendor of cloud computing and they would send back almost books about what they didn't like about our SP. And uh, we had to go through every comment we came back and say we agree or we disagree. And uh, that ultimately did impact the final versions of these drafts. So a page, uh, that's a long answer to your question, but the easiest way is when these things come out on the NIST website, if you're interested, industry, please send us back feedback. Your comments are read. Thank you, Jeff. Much to our chagrin sometimes. But. <laughs> so Richard, uh, GE is obviously an iconic uh, industry partner in pushing the envelope in many areas to include mobility. Can you talk a little bit more about how GE is addressing cybersecurity concerns in your own mobile transformation and implementation? Uh, certainly, not only as a company are we looking to figure out a way to safeguard, I think to what Darren mentioned, the right uh, risks as we do this. Uh, again, more mobile enabling our workforce internally, but also as we're thinking about our products, you know, what we're doing, control surfaces and how, in fact, you know, we, we're thinking a, a lot around security between the subject and the object, just not on the subject object alone. So how can I not only secure the device, how can I ensure, the, ensure that the access it's getting is appropriate for what it has to do, and then how am I ensuring that ultimately the data it's transmitting or, or interacting with is kept safe? So these kinds of safe, safeguards are more ecosystem related as opposed to in the past where maybe the focus was solely on the device itself. Um, we're also recognizing that um, the mobile devices are, are repeating a similar evolution to the PC world. Um, if many of you following the mobile platform, um, you're looking at the evolution of multiple persona capability on these devices, uh, such as Android and Jelly Bean, but, but also uh, Enterprise's uh, uh, Divide and at and Toggle, all kind of creating the ability for you to separate your persona of end user corporate and your personal life. Uh, as Bruce Shiner says, uh, any mobile device strategy for securing it that does not include, I think, a nine-year-old is inherently flawed uh, because of technologies and apps like Angry Birds. Um, we also noticed that these devices tend to be gateway mechanisms to cloud. 
and I know uh, many of you are very interested in, in cloud as a, as a concept, as an opportunity, uh, but how many, how many apps do you think there are normally on a mobile device? Take the national average for the United States. What, what is that, somebody? 22, 22 right about now. So how many of those applications are cloud enabled? It's a great question, because it's a great, you gotta wonder, uh, roughly 30 to 40 percent of those are actually cloud enabled, which means they're back ended as an application by a cloud provider. Now it's kind of hard to think about whether you're like, wait, I have an app. But think of Box.net or Dropbox or Evernote. Those are back ended by a cloud storage technology. So where these things begin to collide with the enterprise is on the personal device side, the persona of you as a regular user. And you, we have to take that into account because of what we call, in, inside you, we call it the geometry of SaaS. What we're seeing now is all of the SaaS providers are beginning to work together to make their apps interoperate. So if you, say, use Salesforce for CRM data, uh, Box.net has a lovely little plugin that says, oh, I see you're in Salesforce. Um, would you like me to synchronize your enterprise data to your personal Box.net account? Now, for the person, that makes that incredibly useful. For the enterprise, that makes it a data protection nightmare. So how do you begin to address that? So we're looking at, again, technologies like virtualization, uh, virtual applications, web top, again, embracing some of that risk as we're presenting services, but also they're isolating other applications that we're concerned about. Because um, to us, it's not just about um, the end user's data any longer, though that's critical. Now it's about reach to industrial controls. And to your earlier point about cyber to physical consequence, we're, we're taking that quite seriously. Jimmy? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with uh, Richard about a lot of things he said. A lot of it is, and we've embraced as an organization the bring your own device capability. We're translating that and migrating it into agency issue types of devices. Uh, our interest is we have to enable our workforce to be able to do their job. And we've got a lot of inspectors out in the field. I don't want them to use. And you've got the personal devices, you've got agency issue devices. We want to be able to, for, we need to be able to provide the right capabilities for them to do their job. But for us to be able to protect our information, if we really do create that dual persona, which we've done through the BYOD approach, if they want to keep their angry birds, that's fine. I need to protect our information, but at the same time provide the capabilities within that container to do their job. And if they're going to end up using cloud-based type solutions, storage places, whatever, it needs to be something that we are able to provide and control. Because again, it's our information and we want to be able to protect it, whatever the sensitivity is. Um, Paige, I, I thought about something that we talked about in the prep call, is, is, um, and in many ways it ties into this, is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Gonna go there You're going to go there. I think that's a good way to end this panel, which is, I, it really is. It, it gets back to what risk are you willing, just because you can, doesn't mean you always should. If you really, I mean, we know, like Richard, you mentioned about the pilots with the iPads at the cockpit. That's one thing. But if you want to start the, do some other things with that, is that really the place we need to go? I, yeah, I completely agree. I, I would say that, um, you know, again, similar to what you said, Darren, when we talk about measurable or acceptable risk, we want to make sure that we have transparency to that first and, and tier how we present something. To your point about separating the person, uh, the individual's persona from the corporate or the workforce persona, absolutely agree. And also, the just because you can doesn't mean you should. We're very much thinking that way because in some instances, when you tier services to BYOD, you, you're all probably seeing those pressures yourself, there may be a subset of things you just simply say no. They don't belong there. You don't use, bring your own device to, to access them. But Jeff, I don't know if you had anything. Oh, uh, the only thing I was going to mention on that, uh, there's a really interesting uh, problem. Like I said, I, I have no solution for this. It's just a problem. It's, um, it's the problem, it's kind of an age-old problem of any, any information system. It's, it's basically just known as data leakage. So whether it's data leakage from a mobile device, whether it's data leakage from a cloud, uh, the interesting thing about clouds is uh, if you're just a subscriber to a cloud, how do you know if the vendors somehow, where you're actually paying them money to store your data, how do you know your data is not leaking? How do you test their cloud when you're just the customer? I mean, they've got the cloud, your data's on the cloud, but how do you know where your cloud, if your data is leaking? So it brings up a very interesting challenge, uh, and this is going to be a really interesting challenge for the, for the whole BYOD type of a situation. Uh, 
a colleague of mine, uh, he came up with a very interesting way of trying to solve the problem in terms of clouds. He just bought a bunch of credit cards and stored a bunch of credit card numbers on, on, uh, on a bunch of clouds that he had purchased uh, data access to. And he let the credit card company be his detector as to whether or not the numbers ever leaked, because if the numbers ever leaked, the numbers got pinged, and he found out about it because he owned the cards. So there are certain kinds of ways you can play the game, but it's a very, very, very difficult problem to figure out uh, when you actually look at this, inter this interrelationship between clouds and, uh, and mobile devices. When data is leaking and where data is uh, leaking too. So it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge when you go down that path. Now the audience has to have some questions. You didn't have enough coffee during lunch. Too much ice cream. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going then. So I, I want to shift the discussion a little bit uh, towards cyber physical system security. And uh, we've talked a lot about the ecosystem, that it's not just a single element in terms of mobility, cloud, et cetera. It's really this ecosystem that we need to address. And what I have observed, even though the executive order and the PDD talks about focus on physical and cyber threats, they still seem to be treated as two distinct elements when in fact uh, there is a relationship and there seems to be a seam in terms of responsibilities as well as the framework and technical solutions around it. And I'm, I'm interested in the panel members' uh, thoughts on that in particular. Yeah, I, I'll say that, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, in, in the program we've started, uh, CyberWorks, um, we, we see the same thing you see, Paige, again, that, that, that intangible nature of cyber that, you know, most people tend to think of it largely as, as loss of a credit card or, or the exploitation of a website. What, what we've started is an actual um, a penetration group within the company to test our products ahead of when we release them. Because even, I think, in software development, there tends to be maybe sometimes a low level of awareness of vulnerabilities that may exist, or they, they maybe lack the attacker's mindset, that they don't think like somebody who, we often ask that, well, why would somebody want to do that? Well, I don't know, maybe they would want to harm something, right? Or, or they wouldn't want to stop something from working, or they would want to take data. So uh, in, in that respect, it's been a, a very successful pattern we've initiated that actually commits the act. Of, of either cyber or cyber to physical and, and testing. And, and by nature of showing the results, it tends to bring people more um, effectively to the table to say, okay, you know, what's the right, because once it's shown, it's very, people absolutely respond to it in a positive manner and say, how can I help fix this? So I think, uh, sometimes I think demonstration is the most powerful tool. And I, I'm not sure enough focus to this point, and, and maybe it is that, um, I, I wouldn't say a degree of secrecy, but a degree of sophistication that's necessary to perform cyber to physical exploit and the desire to, to, to protect those capabilities as you know, either means of national defense or maybe the subset of people who do it are largely working in classified spaces and therefore their findings are not necessarily readily available to the rest of the world. Um, but we have to kind of figure out a way to bridge that awareness curve about how cyber to physical exploits actually occur and uh, like William Gibson said, um, the future's already here, it's just not widely distributed yet. Um, I think we have to figure out how to bring that to people so that they can see it and make it more, more real. But you said it nicely. <laughs> I, you just can't ignore it. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's the reality, I mean, it's the new normal. Yeah. That's what you're say. Any comments? Oh, I was just, just going to mention, uh, a, lo a lot of work in game theory, I, I think, uh, has been applied to this problem. I think, I think DARPA's been doing some work in that area. I remember long before I joined NIST, uh, there was a term that was going around. I, I don't think the term's used much anymore. It was cyber pandemics. And what it, what it was based on, it was based upon the idea that basically you could put up a staggered type of a threat. So basically it's kind of a 30-day event or a 60-day event where, you know, I'll just throw out an example. So. Uh, you slowly put some kind of malware, I guess you'd call it, maybe into some router software. And you know at some point if uh, some system goes down, the router is going to reroute the traffic somewhere else. And there just happens to be that, uh, you know, that, that problematic code that's now been embedded in the router, so there's nowhere to route back to. And then you, 
and you launch your physical attack. And so there was a lot of game playing that went on in that area where you were looking at how could you come up with a really catastrophic type of an infrastructure type of an event. And this event that I'm referring to actually dealt with uh, cutting some fiber in the Midwest and uh, you know, shutting down the financial system in Manhattan. That was just one example. So game theory and game playing is a very interesting way to start to kind of at least come up with some what if scenarios to try to figure out how resilient is your infrastructure. Uh, do you really have the redundancy or the duplication or, or whatever it is you have for, for fail safe operations or continuity uh, of business. So that's an area that I still think a lot of research is being done in and uh, I think it holds a lot of promise. Once again, I think one of the comments made by the gentleman that stood up here, you know, you can have technology for the good or you can have the same technology used for the bad. So when you start playing these types of games and if you're successful in your simulation models or however you actually play the games, uh, uh, you actually can wind up with a lot of bad information you really don't want ever to leak. Uh, but fortunately, I think a lot of our government agencies that do classified work have been playing these games. And I think it's led to a lot of uh, innovations uh, that have helped us over the years that we'll never know about. I'm looking toward the audience for any questions. Can we, can we ask the audience questions? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually, this is a, a unique opportunity for me in industry because I'm, I'm very curious um, and, and maybe because you're all very super secret people, you may not tell me, but um, what, what is your biggest concern when it comes to cyber security? And I know that's a gigantic topic, but when, when you think about it is, it, is it truly the concern of the nation state actor and, and what they're capable of doing in critical infrastructure? What are, what are some of your concerns? I know it. you're all you're all under you know you're all have secret clearances. It's okay. Sorry. Yeah. That's a great point. The gentleman said, uh, uh, "Can you repeat that?" It was underdefined and, and overspending. Right. Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, Someone else wants to take a shot. I'll, I'll take a shot answering that by putting it right back to you on the things you said here today. The issue we have is what is the biggest concern? The problem is the complexity of this subject. And the fact that you brought out right in the beginning, some people think it's warfare, some people think it's my credit card, some people think it's protecting my identity, intrusion detection, you know, bots, malware. They're, the complexity of the subject is so, so broad that it's hard to get your hands around this particular subject to just understand where one addresses it or what is the top priority. I think it's almost a case-by-case -case situation, industry to industry, agency to agency, as to where you need to put the scarce resources. A question I will ask then is with this complexity, and when you think of the tens of thousands of heterogeneous products out there, and the thousands of tools that are out there, and the generations of equipment, mm -hmm. how are we doing and how are you addressing getting skills to address these priorities? You asked some great questions. I'll, I'll maybe just answer them briefly. You know, the, the first thing is, um, you know, bad news isn't getting better with age. So the problem is not going away. It's not getting simpler. Uh, certainly, we, we definitely see technology and, and innovation. So some people see, you know, crisis, and, and we absolutely see opportunity. When, when we talk about the collision of terms, you know, G talks a lot about the industrial internet. And when you think about those two concepts of colliding, you know, traditional state, industrial, and the revolution of the internet, and you collide them, they create all sorts of interesting dilemmas, but they also create tremendous opportunity to improve. And we actually think in some instances that what we're doing in the R&D space is going to help us leapfrog all of the things that we've found in the legacy world just can't be fixed. You know, when you talk about systems that are 18 or 22 years old, leapfrog them. Don't, don't try to patch them and stick something on them to make them better. You know, figure out a way to leapfrog that. And, and that's actually created more out-of-the-box thinking about how we protect. And I mentioned a couple of things about legacy, how we would address through either virtualizing a platform or isolating it or encapsulating it like uh, legacy SCADA protocols, if, if folks are familiar with that, the way machines talk to one another, rather than continuing to traffic that, which is a tremendous 
horror of a nightmare problem on big networks, you encapsulate them in newer protocols so that they can be protected by newer technologies, as a case in point. The second thing about the talent gap is we're, we're looking at it across the globe. It's not just the problem, it's everywhere. And uh, we've started, uh, for us, we've started working with, um, with Israel, who um, as a country is somewhat very familiar with this problem of protecting critical infrastructure as a nation and looking for areas where there's talent that we can bring into the equation to help us better figure out defensive scenarios and startups and technology. So that's just, just one example. The, the third thing is start practical. We're an incredibly practical company. So we're looking at things. Um, there are three elements that all industrial controls must do. They must be managed. They, they must register in some capacity. And they must transmit uh, back and forth. This is kind of fundamental. We think the flip side of that coin is with every bit of management, we have to have policy. And you mentioned attestation or attribution. We think in registration, there needs to be higher forms of identity so that when machines talk to one another, we know it is what it says it is, the, the dilemma of Stuxnet. Uh, and then obviously in transmission, we need integrity. We need to figure out ways to increase the integrity of what we're transmitting to better protect it and, and stop the clear text dialogue and stop the distribution of data without it going to where we want it to go. So those are the three foundational things that, that we're thinking about as a company. Jim, thank you for the question. I, two quick points, and in some ways it builds on Richard's. Skills are always going to be a challenge for every single organization in this room, for the infrastructure, for the federal agencies. The thing we have to stay focused on is not just attracting them, but obviously retaining them, but even probably even most importantly, keeping those skills fresh. Because technology, as everybody in this room knows, continues to evolve rapidly. And how do we keep those skills fresh? And so there's got to be that investment in our people to be able to do that, to do that work. And to your point about the focus, first thing I thought of is really the number one priority for our agency, is keeping our existing fleet of operating reactors safe and operating safely. And as long as we stay focused on that, then we'll be in good shape. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll just add a comment. You know, we talk often about skills related to the cybersecurity professionals, I'll call them. But bottom line still is our weakest link is the individual user. And we still need to focus on situational awareness across the board uh, and common good hygiene um, efforts across the board. I think that will do a tremendous amount no matter what we face in the future because it's still going to be the individual that's going to be our weakest link in my opinion. Uh, so 